so thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I hope that everyone is having a nice start to spring. My name is Fiona Wright, and I am the Public Programs Coordinator of Carleton University Art Gallery. Uh, and I am pleased to welcome you to the eighth edition of Disruptions Lecture Series featuring the ethnomusicologist, Dr. Jody Cripps. <clears throat> oh, it seems like someone's asking about the interpreter I'm seeing in the chat and also folks oh. signing that. Oh, I, let's see, let's see. I've pinned Michael, it's Michael Friedman, who's the interpreter. Uh, he's been pinned, but I can spotlight him. There you go. And Sarah's suggesting that um, we all uh, turn, or that um, people turn off their cameras for the most part. Um, okay. So I, uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, QEG, uh, like the Carleton campus and the city of Ottawa, is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. If you are joining us from elsewhere, I encourage you to let us know in the chat box below whose traditional territory you're located on. Uh, so no matter where we are on Turtle Island or elsewhere in the world, we each have our own way of reflecting on and reckoning with the responsibilities to and relationships we have with this land. Uh, but I hope that it always includes public, public acknowledgement and gratitude towards the traditional and ongoing custodians and finding ways of supporting their work, knowledge, and rights. Disruptions is curated by Michael Orsini, a professor in the Institute of Feminist and Gender Studies at Ottawa U. And I'll invite him to speak in a few moments. I'll just go over some access checks. There is live captioning, ASL interpretation, and described video available. To turn on the live captioning, you can click the up icon on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. Uh, for ASL interpretation, you can pin the ASL interpreter and presenter, Jody, uh, by right-clicking on them. And pinning ensures that they're always visible, um, even when uh, I'm sharing a screen, uh, which I'll be doing for a part of this presentation. We're also really pleased to be able to offer described video for two of the music videos. Janice Cripps' Eyes, and Pamela Witcher's I Honor You. Mm -hmm. So you can listen to a described version of these songs by tuning into the uh, translation channel when they're playing. So to do this, you click the interpretation button below. It will say Spanish, uh, but it's the visual description channel. <laughs> so Zoom is still catching up. Uh, and also please find time to stretch, to drink water, and take a break from the screen uh, if you need it. So here's what to expect from this event. Dr. Cripps has pre-recorded a 40 minute presentation, which we will watch together. It includes examples of signed music. Nice. Afterwards, Michael Orsini will uh, lead a live Q&A with the audience. Please put any questions in the chat and we'll answer them as best we can. Uh, Carleton University Art Gallery 
acknowledges our co-sponsors with uh, sincere gratitude. This event is generously supported by the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Risa Greenberg like Digital Initiative well Fund, as well as numerous departments at Carleton University, the Office of the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, the Pauline Jewett Institute um, of Women's and Gender Studies, the Institute for Comparative Studies in Literature, Art, and Culture, the Reed Initiative, the School for Studies in Art and Culture, the Carleton Disability Awareness Center, the Graduate Students Association, and Carleton University Students Association. Um, I also wanted to thank Denise Deshaw in the School of Linguistics and Language Studies for assisting in the promotion of this event. Uh, to Michael Friedman, our interpreter, um, who also did the translation work for this presentation. And to Kat Germain, who created the visual descriptions for this event. Oh, and now uh, I want to welcome Michael Orsini to introduce Dr. Cripps. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Fiona. I just want to make sure everyone, everything is okay with the pinning and interpreting. I see lots of messages. Uh, so if there are any uh, issues, folks can please uh, post a message in the chat if you're having difficulty pinning the interpreter. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, yes, my name is Michael Orsini. Uh, welcome uh, to all from uh, where you are located to the eighth installment of the Disruptions uh, series. Uh, thanks again to Sandra Dick and to Fiona Wright for uh, supporting this initiative from the get-go and for being such wonderful co-conspirators. The series is motivated by an interest in challenging conversations about disability, about art, and about disability art. I'm conscious of the privileged space afforded to folks like me who can access spaces and places that have been less welcoming to deaf and disabled people and artists. I'm really excited about our pre presentation today uh, by Dr. Jody Cripps, who is truly a leader in the field. Evidence of this from your turnout uh, this evening as well. And I should say Canadian to boot. I'm especially pleased to feature the work of Dr. Cripps and some of his collaborators, given the increased prominence of deaf arts. This is the first time um, the Disruption series has centered deaf artistic expression and the first time that music has been the focus. To quote a landmark report from the Canada Council for the Arts, quote, while deaf and disability cultures share supportive and often collaborative relationships, they are rooted in different histories and trajectories. Deaf cultures, the authors note, enjoys its own distinct legacy and artistic development. So Dr. Cripps will deliver a multimedia presentation on the state of the art associated with signed music, drawing on his experience as a scholar and performer. Dr. Cripps works to push back against the idea that deaf people are somehow unable to enjoy music yeah. due to their deafness. So ultimately the work of folks like Dr. Cripps seeks to redefine, I think, how we understand something as fundamental as music. Deaf perspectives express music through hands and through movement and disrupt, there's that word again, everyday practices of audism, which refers to quote, a normative system that subordinates deaf and hard of hearing people through a set of practices, actions, beliefs, and attitudes that value hearing people and their ways of life to the detriment of a diversity of languages and ways of moving. And that also is from the Canada Council. 
So Dr. Cripps is an assistant professor of American Sign Language in the Department of Languages at Clemson University in South Carolina. He's conducted groundbreaking ethnological research, ethnomusicolog ethnomusicological research in Canada on the creative process and has produced a sign music showcase some of you are familiar with titled The Black Drum, which was funded by the Canada Council for the Arts via the Canadian Cultural Society of the Deaf. The music incorporated Cripps sign music theories and was selected as one of 10 acts featured at the Clin d'Oeil Festival in France uh, in 2019. So that is all for me. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cripps to our virtual space as he takes us on a journey in understanding signed music. Thank you. My name is Jody Cripps from Clemson University in South Carolina, where I work in the Department of Languages, American Sign Language. Before I begin, there are many people I'd like to thank for their assistance in this disruption series. In particular, Dr. Michael Orsini at the University of Ottawa and Fiona Wright at the Carlton Art Gallery have been instrumental in making this presentation possible. There are many others I need to thank for their contributions and there will be a list of acknowledgements at the end of the presentation. My presentation is entitled A Journey in Understanding Signed Music. First, I'd like to discuss some myths about deaf people that have generated some discussion. There's a popular notion that deaf people can't really experience music as it is based on audible sounds. Furthermore, signed music has largely consisted of translated lyrics of sound-based music. Merely signing the words of the music, right? But the product is not an authentic musical experience for deaf people and is based on music that was created for and by people who hear it. There is also often an emphasis on deaf people experiencing the sounds of music through vibrations felt in the body. Again, this is a limited experience of music based on sound that does not constitute a fully accessible experience of music for deaf people. Finally, there is a common misconception that because deaf people don't hear, they live in silence, that they can't enjoy music that they lack what others have. And to the contrary, as we will see, deaf people in fact do have their own music. To introduce the concept of signed music, let's begin with this beautiful piece of visual art. If you're following along in sign language, note that there are a couple of different signs that are used in ASL for the term signed music. But notice here the concept denoted by the I merged with a musical score. This piece was created by deaf artist Harry Williams. And it explores the possibility of a visual mode of music, how sign language can bridge the world of sound-based music with a world of visual aesthetics from a deaf perspective how we can break through the barrier between the two worlds. There are new conceptualizations developing in the area of signed music. 
Traditionally, music has been thought of as purely sound-based, with all that that entails. But we could ask the question, is there music that exists in a visual mode? And the answer that is emerging is clearly yes. For example, we could look at the concept of musical notes, which could include hand shapes and movement. With all of the possibilities that moving in 3D space would entail, including the creative use of circular and straight motions in all directions. This could include facial expressions as well. And just as sound-based music can have lyrics or be instrumental, signed music as well may or may not contain signed words. Instead of words, the hands can be used to form aesthetically pleasing shapes and movement. Example number one is a piece entitled Eyes by Janice Cripps, who happens to be my sister. She created this piece to demonstrate a point to our family, all of whom are deaf. She wanted to show us what music would look like through sign. This interested me because up until that time, she had been doing a lot of what I described earlier, translations of song lyrics into sign language. I never found it to be all that satisfactory, but this piece had a great impact on me. The piece makes use of hand shapes and axes of movement that are without words. The piece could be described as non-lyric or at least less lyric, employing movement and rhythm instead of words. Let's watch.
So that's eyes, a piece without lyrics. Example two is a piece by Pamela Witcher, who is from Montreal and is currently living and working in the Quebec and Ottawa area. Pamela has been performing signed music as well as poetry and is also a graphic artist. Her work is more recent and the piece I've selected does include lyrics. It's a tribute to her deaf mother and it's entitled, I Honor You. I'd like to point out some of the signed words that will come up repeatedly in the, in the piece. I, honor, you, blood, Love. You'll see these words repeated throughout the piece, but flourishes and movements that are non-lyric as well. And she moves back and forth between the two. Let's watch and see how much you can follow.
So far, we've seen that signed music can have lyrics, but it can also exist without lyrics, and it can flow between the two. We've seen examples of all of this. I'd like to briefly discuss a different category in the next example. It's by Dr. Clayton Valley, who was well known for his work in American Sign Language Poetry, or ASL Poetry. He composed many pieces and was a prolific per performer. I've chosen just one piece entitled Hands that was one of his most popular. It's actually extremely brief, but it demonstrates this separate category of ASL poetry. In his performance, he places the four seasons in locations in space, winter, spring, summer, and fall. In each of these locations, he uses a sign to represent each of the seasons without saying the name of the season. The signs reference leaves falling, grass blowing in the wind, flowers blooming for spring, and snow falling for winter. Here's his performance. In Dr. Valley's work, we see a different genre from sign music, that of ASL poetry. The pieces are short, they do have a rhythm, but it has a different quality. Signed music has a longer duration, employs continuous repeated movements, can be without words. As we've seen, some of the music has lyrics, some of it doesn't. These are some of the features that differentiate signed music from ASL poetry. Sign music is on the rise, and it represents a break from a defective view of deaf people being incapable of having music of their own. It's been thoroughly demonstrated that they do. And while there is evidence of earlier attempts to create music in deaf history, contemporary work is achieving a much clearer understanding of the true potential and wider implications of deaf music. Composing high-quality works of signed music requires a deep understanding of and fluency in sign language in order to create something that's truly aesthetic. There is a growing movement of deaf artists and performers who are joining this movement, and through networking and mentoring, we are seeing great innovation and development. Evidence of this can be seen in shows like Black Drum. Black Drum started in Toronto and has since been performed in Reims, France. It's had very good public reception and the performers themselves have expressed how liberating it feels to engage an audience with an art form that is truly ours, of the deaf community. That it felt like a very open experience. Here's a short clip.
What are the implications of shows like Black Drum and others like it? What possible impacts are there for the broader society? One is the possibility of moving away from the insistence that music be sound-based toward a greater sensitivity for different types of music that include other senses. Signed music is one of those, but we could also think about the possibility of a tactile form of music or possibly others. The formal recognition of professional signed music could be a further development. The deaf community could be recognized for their work in a field that we didn't think was possible for them. All of this is leading to support for an authentic, fully immersive experience of music for deaf people. And understanding that finally deaf people can fully participate in a music that emanates from the deaf community, from deaf people themselves, and the sense of freedom and liberation that that entails. This could have further implications for how we define music more broadly not only for deaf audiences, but for all possible forms of music involving all senses. My own journey with signed music began with the deep impact that my family had on me. My sister with her piece eyes that I showed you earlier opened my eyes to the possibilities of innovations in deaf music. This sparked my interest in studying the subject to clarify the very meaning of music in the deaf community, to gain insights into ourselves as deaf people and the role that music plays for us. So I set out to learn more about the topic. And as I began a study of music, I was introduced to the field of ethnomusicology by two people. Uh, the first was Anita Small, and the other, Ellie Lionbloom. And the three of us have collaborated since. Ellie suggested this approach because ethnomusicology examines the relationship between music and culture. It uses the lens of culture to gain a deeper understanding of music, including the norms and behaviors that are considered culturally appropriate. And so we've been working together to apply this approach to signed music and has led to, for example, uh, our analysis of lyric signed music as opposed to non-lyric, as we've discussed today. We're just beginning to identify and classify these different forms of signed music. This work is still new, but with the proper lens, these issues are becoming, uh, are beginning to come into focus. My work currently focuses on the notion of visual sounds and an analysis of the role they play in signed music. I'm also looking at the process of enculturation for these deaf artists, their thoughts and feelings about becoming creators of music from a cultural perspective. In addition to studying the topic of signed music, I also found myself drawn into actually composing and performing pieces of my own. In the process of doing my research, I found that my own curiosity was piqued. This came out of conversations with my sister where she encouraged me to explore my own creativity and we brainstormed a lot of ideas. And now I'll show you some of what came out as a result. This was my first piece, my first performance called Rain. 
this came out of collaborations with my sister Janice in which we were exploring the idea, uh, playing with the idea of a musical note a discrete unit that can be repeated, in this case, three times. That would look like this. So we came up with various signed notes using different hand shapes and movements, exploring different possibilities. But we never finished it, and it got put on hold. Later, a colleague at Tosin University encouraged me to take it up again. This is where I used to work, Tosin University. So this colleague, his name was uh, JB, or Jason Begg. Uh, we decided to make a production of it, complete with video editing. JB um, helped out with all of this, advising. He's a performer himself. And he, my sister, uh, and myself collaborated on the project. You will see this concept of musical notes, some of them words, some of them not. And I would describe this piece as having fewer lyrics and using more non-lyric movements. And it's all about rain. Here it is. My second performance is of a piece called Larry the Lion. This one was very emotional for me. Just to back up for a moment, one piece of advice I got from Pamela Witcher, whose work you saw earlier, as well as from deaf performers, various people, was that the work truly has to come from the heart you have to be really vulnerable. You have to put your heart and soul into it. It's something I took to heart. A producer of Black Drum expressed uh, that we need to more fully develop ASL song lyrics. He wanted to see more robust, fully developed uh, lyrics in ASL. He felt that that was still missing. So I was thinking about all of this, and I had known a man named Larry Opperman. He was son of someone I grew up around, deaf, worked uh, at a different school, but was known in the deaf community. Well, he passed away. And my family encouraged me to do a tribute to him and my odd relationship with him. 
what came out was this piece. His sign name looks like this on the chest. Um, and um, Larry and I had a special relationship. As a young boy, I was afraid of him. His uh, appearance in particular, his bushy hair and long beard looked like a lion's mane to me. And for the longest time, uh, I was scared of him. So he passed away and I decided to do a song with full lyrics. And um, next you'll see what I came up with, my heartfelt expression. There are some signs that in the piece that you might need to know, lion. Mother. Grow up. These are words that come up repeatedly. Um, you. Good. Heart. So again, you'll see these signs used uh, again and again. Here's my performance.
So we've seen examples from a deaf perspective, from a cultural perspective, of deaf creations, including my own. I believe this work is worthy of greater recognition and wider acceptance. We need to broaden our understanding to include more diversity in music. That's my appeal. I'd like to close on a lighter note with something humorous, perhaps cute, to revisit the question, what is music?